want to welcome you back to life. Back to the one that can make your next chapter your best chapter. Hallelujah. How can it be? testify that my life has been built on the foundation that was preached to me by my father, lived out by my parents. My life was built on that. My future, my marriage, my child, everything has been built on this foundation. This is what keeps us when things are happening that we don't fully understand. This is what anchors us. Because we're not sure that we can trust God, that God is going to withhold something good from us if we obey him. But if you're willing and obedient, the Bible says, you will eat the good of the land. Don't focus on the good of the land. Focus on being willing and obedient. That's right. And the church saying, come on. Loving you. <laughs> it sounds crazy, don't it? Hey. That's how it's supposed to be. Let me tell you what it means. Less of me. That's why. I don't wanna love nobody but you. I don't wanna love nobody but you. Father. I don't wanna love nobody, love nobody but you. I really mean it this time. I don't wanna love nobody but you. Jesus. I don't wanna love nobody. Let me tell you what it does. He the day. Come on. He will come through. He will let you down, but he won't let us what superheroes do. See, I will never find no way to love. A love like this makes my heart beat. Forever run the day. All I want to do is make you proud. Let me say it again. He the day. He will come through. It feels so good. I don't want you carrying anything that you're not designed to carry. And so I need you to cast all of these cares, uh, some of the cares that you don't fully understand, cast those cares upon me. Why? Because I love you and I care for you and allow my grace, uh, which is sufficient in your weakness, to sustain you. Don't be troubled. Uh, there's a place that God has for you with him in his presence. Uh, I'm going to make sure that you are right with me. I am the way. Uh, there is the presence of God, and God rewards you with his very self, with his presence. Uh, the reward is the anointing of God. The reward is the grace of God. Your destination is smack dab in the perfect will of God, in the presence of God. I want you to see it until it drives you. I want you to see it until it drives on the sacrifices. You're going to give up anything that you need to give up to get to that place in God. Welcome, 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 Wheaton Christian Center family and friends. Come on, stand on your feet in the house. 
Come on in the room, come on in the room, and to all those that are watching online, welcome to the service today. Can we just give God a shout of praise, family? Come on, come on, let's check the temperature in the room. Can you give God a shout of praise? Come, come, come on, it was a powerful time in, in prayer this morning. Our hearts and minds are already set to praise God. Now, can you give God a shout of praise like you really mean it? No, nah, no, nah, come on, come on, come on, raise it up. Hey, Ben, can you raise it up just a little bit? Take them up to where they're supposed to go. Come on, come on, come on, raise it up. Father, we bless your name. Come on, loosen up in here already. God is worthy of praise. He's worthy of glory. Come on, was anybody glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord? This is a house of praise. Come on, somebody shout his name. Come on, say, God, we love you. We're so grateful to be here today. Come on, are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? I love it, I love it. Come on, come on, come on. Weeping may endure for the night, family, but guess what? Joy comes in the morning, and I got good news. Joy is right now. Hallelujah, let's go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing it together. to sorrow our joy is coming in the morning hallelujah in the morning come on and sing it with us this morning let's go and bring out we won't submit to sorrow our joy is coming in the morning yeah in the morning
make somebody whole this morning. In John chapter 5, there is a man laying at the gate of Bethesda, and Jesus comes to him and says to him, will thou be made whole? But if you study it in the Greek expression, Jesus is really saying, do you want me to give your life back to you? He comes to the man, and you've been here all this time, do you want your life back? That's why I've come, to give your life back to you. This morning, I believe God is going to give somebody their life back. You're going to put that medicine down. God's going to heal your body. He's going to give your life back to you. He's going to bring your children back to you. Come on and lift up those hands all over the building and just say it. Say, yes, I will be made whole this morning, God. Give me my life back. Give me my life back, God. Hallelujah. We're just going to trust God this morning. We're going to stop trying and trust Him. Thank you, Lord. We trust you. Thank you, God. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine And he's been the fourth man in the fire Time after time I'm born of his spirit I'm washed in his blood And what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough Cause I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail He will never fail trust in God, my Savior, who will never, he 
never fails family thank you Jesus perfect submission and all is at rest cause I know the author of tomorrow is on he's on in my steps so this is my story, and this is my song. Let's praise him. I'm praising my risen King and Savior. Come on and sing it out. Say, I trust in God. Because I trust in God, my Savior. My Savior, the one who will live. Anybody trusted him this morning? He hears your cry. I saw the Lord and he heard and he answered. I saw the Lord and he heard and he answered. I saw the Lord and he heard and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. Come on, you got it. Let's go. And he heard, and he answered. I saw, I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw, I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I, 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 saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw, I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard. 
trusting God, my Savior, the one who will never He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. I walk by faith. I will walk by faith. I don't walk by sight. I will walk by faith. I don't walk by sight. Cause I trust in God. I, I trust in God. I will walk by faith. I don't walk by sight. I will walk by faith. I don't walk by sight. Cause I trust in God I trust in God Said I'll walk by faith I will walk by I don't walk by sight I will walk by faith I don't walk by sight Cause I trust I trust in God I trust in God One more time I walk I will I don't want by I will walk by faith. I don't want by sight. I trust in God. I trust in God. Hallelujah. Come on, just lift those hands all over the building. Come on and just release that worship. Come on. That's it, that's it. Release it. You're right on the cusp of it. Come on. Yes, come on, come on. Release that worship in the house. Let the Holy Spirit have his way. Let him have his way. Let him have his way.
Just worship him right there. Just worship him right there. Father, we worship. We worship you. Let it be our sweet. sing to the Lord, just lift his hand. this morning. That's it. Just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we worship you. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord, family. And it's such a sweet presence, isn't it? understand what Pastor Arthur says. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? Come on, just, just five more seconds. Just tell them how wonderful he is this morning. to say call him like you know him Jesus can somebody just call him like they know him for a moment just call him like you know him Jesus 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 come on and call him like you know him hallelujah it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you Jesus come on we try to move <laughs>
Jesus this morning. The devil's been busy, but guess what? God has been busier. God has been busier. Come on, come on, come on. The devil can't have my praise. He can't have my worship. He can't have my family. He can't have it. I come to magnify God. Jesus is so great, man. This makes me want to shout. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise, all of the glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, okay. I guess we can stay here forever. <laughs> Where you'll find me is in the house of the Lord. I'll be dwelling in the house of God. Hallelujah. Well, it's so good to see your faces, family. We packed in here today. We are here strong like horseradish. We are strong in here today. <laughs> Turn to the left and to the right of you. And tell your brother and sister something good today. Tell them something good. Come on, I see the favor of God coming upon you. Today you are going to jump leaps and bounds. I see in this service you're walking in divine health. Come on, I see the power and the might of God coming upon you. We declare it out of our mouths today in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And as you're taking your seats also, let's pay attention to the announcements. See what's happening at WCC. Good morning, Wheaton Christian Center family and friends. My name is Lydia Arthurs, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to service this morning. If this is your first time joining, I'd like to say an extra special welcome to you. We pray that you're encouraged by today's service and you'll come back and join us again. Now, as we see each week, it's very important that we stay connected and informed. So here's a complete rundown of everything happening here at Wheaton Christian Center. Hi there, are you new to our WCC family? If so, welcome to you. Please feel free to join us in anything you hear in today's announcements. And if you're joining us in person, stop by our welcome desk in the lobby. We would love the chance to say hello. Are you looking to go deeper in the word? Join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings where Pastor Paul will host a special series called Deliverance throughout this month of March. All are welcome to join and we hope to see you there. Have you joined a connect group yet? Our new session of Connect Group starts this week. Visit us on our Church Center app or our website so you can find the best small group for you. Our next service of baby dedication will be Sunday, March 24th. If you have a baby or a child that you would like to dedicate, 
Visit our Church Center app for more details. Are you interested in taking the next step in your faith journey? Visit our Church Center app to register for our next baptism class to learn all about this very important commitment in your walk with Christ. Wheaton Christian Center family and friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Be sure to subscribe to all our social media sites so you don't miss a single thing here at Wheaton Christian Center. Enjoy the rest of the service. Praise the Lord, Wheaton Christian Center family. Uh, the presence of God is in this place so thick. And as believers, the most sacred thing that we do is we celebrate the redemptive work of our Lord and Savior. And so uh, this is a sacred thing. And uh, the Bible says how we, are to, how we ought to approach the table of the Lord. And this is not something that is mandatory. This is uh, based on your free will. But if there is unconfessed sin, it's my responsibility to warn you, don't partake. Uh, but the Bible says, uh, as we will uh, see that as we examine ourselves, and even in your seat, you can examine yourself, and if the Holy Spirit brings anything, you just say, Lord, forgive me. And he's faithful and just to do so. But this is a holy thing that we do. The table is the Lord's. The feast is for his disciples. Let all who with true repentance have forsaken their sin and look to Christ alone for salvation partake in this holy observance for their soul's comfort and delight. The word is taken from Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Praise be to the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring into remembrance that our Savior with outstretched arms on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because of our sins, because of the sin of the world. And worthy is the lamb that was slain for sinners, slain for you and for me. We're thankful, Father God, because of the finished work of the cross, because of the risen Savior that we have been forgiven. And we now have new life. We have deliverance. We have healing. We have newness of life. We have life and that more abundantly in Christ. And we are the, now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, who has taken away our sins, his broken body, and the blood that was shed that washes us white as snow. We are thankful this morning that we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We're going to partake together. You may remove the cellophane from your communion elements. And this represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Preserves you blameless and in divine health unto everlasting life. It's our Savior who said, my body is flesh. Flesh that was broken for you. There's healing here. There's healing in his name. And we're thankful for that. That we can rejoice that our God loves us. And we can partake now 
We partake now and be thankful for what Christ has done for us. And we give him thanks. We're going to partake together. We're going to take and eat until life anew. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take. Likewise, after supper, he passed the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, God's solemnly binding oath of agreement in my blood, which is shed for you. Let us take and drink, knowing that the Savior's blood affects the remission or sending back of our sin. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy where the blood is sprinkled upon the mercy seat and find help in our time of need. Let us drink and let us be truly thankful. Thank God for the blood. Hallelujah. Why don't you stand to your feet and let's just take a moment to worship him. Praise his name. Let's continue in worship. We love the Lord, we love. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is free. Speak Jesus, cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. glory 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 the name of Jesus place we honor you we honor your presence you're faithful you're good you're a stronghold in the day of trouble and you know those who put their trust in you so here we are in your presence we give you our lives we give you our hopes our dreams our aspirations we lay it at your feet and we delight ourselves in you and we trust you to give us the desires of our heart. Be glorified today. As we know, you are already exalted in this place. Continue to have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Well, we praise God for another opportunity to come together. It's always exciting when the people of God come and when we come together in Jesus' name, he says, I'm there. And when Jesus is there, we know anything can happen. So I want you to raise your level of faith this morning and start to believe God to do something that is, is exceedingly abundantly above. I don't know what you were thinking before, but whatever you're thinking, you need to open yourself to something new and something different and something beyond because your God is bigger. His greatness, the Bible says, is unsearchable. Uh, we're not going to take a lot of time, but we want to give you the opportunity to continue in worship through giving and receiving. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we bless you. And Lord, we don't seek the blessing, but we seek the blesser. And you've already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, Lord. And we thank you that we can put our trust in you. You know what things we have need of before we ask. And so we're not worried about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, where we're going to live, what we're going to wear, because you've got us. We belong to you. And so, Lord, we trust you over every area of our lives. And with the strength, with the resources, with the might, with the ability that we have, we seek to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to give you a quick reminder. Uh, we said that we are recalibrating. In so doing, we're going deeper. And we've opened Wednesday nights not to disturb uh, certainly what you have going on in your connect groups. That's not my intention. Uh, but there are some things that I know God has wanted to impart, to feed, and to develop his people. And so on this Wednesday, 7 o'clock, I'm going to be teaching, uh, starting off with a four-part series. I don't know why I say four parts, because... As we start to dig, there's so much treasure that's unearthed, but I'm going to try to do four weeks 
on deliverance, and it's not just a teaching, uh, but we want to experience the liberty. I believe that God wants his people free. And there's no reason for you, as a child of God, to live in bondage. No, no, no. Uh, so Wednesday night, we're going to come here at 6.30 just to pray. And we'll be out there in the, in the lobby area. That's real set up. So it'll be intimate setting. And we believe, believe God. I want to commend the team last week. Uh, I was kind of concerned that, you know, the fire alarm was going to go off again today because it got so hot in here. It sets off the alarm, and they, they, they checked. And it's interesting that they could not find a reason. There was a smoke detector that went off, and they checked it. There was nothing wrong. They could not find a reason why it went off. So my dad used to say, those things that are beyond our control, we have to trust it's the will of God. And I think... Uh, God disrupted our ordinary scheduled program um, because he wanted our attention. And praise God for the, all, all of the guest services, all the emergency teams, the children's ministry did an outstanding job. The children were out of the place in 45 seconds. Some of you parents, you know, you were scared for your children. You went back and your children were ready outside. Uh, we have an excellent team, and so... We just uh, give God glory for that. Amen. All right. Join me uh, in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to start off there and we'll see where we end up today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Open our eyes to see in our hearts to understand what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us at church. And we commit to be doers, not forgetful hearers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God, verse 18, is revealed, uh, it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. It is revealed against all ungodliness and of unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness meaning right standing with God. Righteousness means in our lives that uh, we have to come into proper alignment in every area with God. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God must be seen. It's not something that is ethereal. It's not something that uh, is... Uh, that can't be touched or can't be felt or can't be experienced. It is something that is very real. It, the righteousness of God is revealed, right standing, alignment. And so we believe that this year God has really emphasized that we have to recalibrate. Recalibration means that we are coming into alignment with God's standard. Our lives are coming into alignment. Sometimes uh, there could be minor adjustments, sometimes major adjustments.
but whatever it takes for us to come into alignment uh, because the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It's not eating or drinking. The Gentiles worried about what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, uh, where they're going to live. But seeking the kingdom, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God in Romans chapter 14, verse 17 is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And we're calling uh, ourselves to find that posture of submission. And there's a posture where the power of God can flow. There's a posture where the righteousness of God can be revealed. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For the just, and we discovered that that word just is the same word that is used for righteous. For the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, we live by faith, and Paul says, because we understand that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, God uh, has not appointed us as his beloved children to wrath. But I don't want to preach a half gospel. Uh, the wrath of God is revealed. When we talk about righteousness, when we talk about God's law, uh, God's way, God's uh, standard, uh, when we talk about righteousness as being aligned with God's kingdom, God's rule, righteousness coming into align with God's authority, submitting to God's word, righteousness uh, is measuring God's standard. Righteousness has to do uh, with, uh, with, with, with our submitting to his authority in fellowship with the authority, obedience to God's law, uh, fulfilling his requirement. You uh, accomplishing his purpose and will. Righteousness is not passive. Righteousness is not sitting there and doing nothing, uh, but righteousness is active. It is involved. Righteousness is walking in the fear or reverence of God. That's what righteousness is. So, God says, in your life, as you receive the gospel and you walk by faith, there's something that begins to manifest in your life, and it's righteousness. But you cannot separate God's righteousness from his justice. Sometimes the words are interchangeable. Uh, when we talk about the righteousness of God, we're talking about the justice of God. In the culture right now, systemic racism is a term that we've all heard of. We hear of its prevalence. We hear uh, that the system, uh, the corrupt system, is uh, against certain people. Well, for us as believers, um, we're not surprised with, with that. That doesn't surprise us. Uh, you got, if, if it's a system of man, I'm sure it's there, there's lust in the system, there's racism in the system, there's hatred in the system, there's evil in the system. Uh, there's every evil 
is in the system of man. That's why the system of man, the kingdoms of this world, are destined to become the kingdoms of our Lord. So, no big deal for us. We live in a corrupt system, even at its best. You know, when we, when we talk about, you know, being great, well, you got to measure greatness. It's relative. Uh, because it's all predicated on standard. Uh, God's standard is different. So, I mean, let's do the best we can. Let's be as great as we possibly can. Yes, but at our best, man at his best, God's greatness is unsearchable. So guess what? As long as it's the system of man, it will never be righteous. You see, you, you represent another kingdom. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. That's why we pray for our leaders. Uh, we pray for those who are in authority, but we're not of this world. Because this system can never grant justice according to God's system. Even if they try to recompense, they can never get it right. It'll never be fair. You will spend your whole life crying over fairness. I remember when we we're pouring uh, the Kool-Aid and there's so much Kool-Aid left and you're pouring it for you and your friend. And you remember when you try to get it even. You try to make it fair. And whenever you poured it, uh, the person is looking at you kind of funny. Because it's never fair. That's the system. That is the corrupt system that we live in right now. It's unfair. It's unjust. It's evil. It does not meet God's standard. It needs to be recalibrated. It needs to come in line with God's authority. This will free you up. I'm not surprised uh, when I'm at a Christian school and when my child goes on a field trip, we live in, in this uh, uh, we're not surprised that when they go on a field trip and they get all the parents uh, to carpool to the field trip. Uh, a class of like, I think it was being 70, 90 students. In the class, there were four students that looked, had the appearance, skin tone, and the Bible says we don't regard anyone after the flesh. Uh, like my daughter, and my wife was doing one of the carpoolers, Car, she was carpooling some of the students and helping as a parent, chipping in. And they put all of the kids that look like my daughter, they put them all in the same car. And when I go there, because these are Christians, and so I'm like, I'm on your side. We got to set it. We got to set an example. I'm with you. I'm, and so I want to come behind and whisper, at, at, we're part of the same team here. I, I want us to be an example to the world. And so I'm on, when I'm coming and talking to them and saying, you know what, um, maybe this is something we ought to consider. Uh, they said it was just a coincidence. It was a coincidence. These are our brothers and sisters. This is our problem. I'm not, I'm not here to say, I mean, hey, look, uh, I had to get delivered from my own issues, all right? <laughs> there were some things, uh, my, my, my first, my, my oldest sister who got married, when she got married, I wasn't in the wedding. I was supposed to be in the wedding, but I had spoken into existence that I wasn't gonna be in the wedding. Uh, 
because I was busy in that season of life fighting the power. And so there are some things, that, and I spoke some things, and I cried like a baby. I didn't mean to do, because it, it tur turned out when I went to get my tux, I just got back from Africa, first trip to Africa, and I uh, came back, and uh, they went to go try on my tux, and they came, and they gave me the bill, and my dad was coming in after me, and they said, well, you can't take the tux until you, you get the bill, uh, you know, until you pay the bill. I ain't got no money. He's coming. I said, okay. Uh, give my dad the tux. He's coming in right after me. And so I get it back in my Ford Escort and I go and kick it. The next day, I go to my father's room and say, where's my tux? He says, what tux? So I already spoken that I wasn't going to be there because I had my own issues. There was something in my system that was unrighteous and I, and I felt I ruined the wedding. But, you know, my sister, she didn't let her makeup uh, she was going to damage her makeup over me not being there. Uh, so, I, we, 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 don't, we, we don't look at the system of man from a lofty place because we know uh, that there are some things that we're working out. But God is a God of justice. That's the point I was making. God is a God of justice. And you can't separate God's justice from his righteousness. Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Psalm 45, verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Amos 5, 24. That verse made famous by... Martin Luther King, but let justice run like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. You cannot separate God's righteousness from his justice. Uh, the just or the righteous, you see how we get the word justice, it comes from righteousness. You can't separate it. And so God in his justice has to deal with unrighteousness. It's not comfortable. It's not nice to talk about. It doesn't make us feel good to talk about unrighteousness. Uh, but God, if he's a just God, he has to punish unrighteousness. And when he punishes unrighteousness, that is his righteous judgment. It's foundational in the faith. Uh, there is a balance. When we talk about recalibrating, it speaks uh, that there is a standard when you talk about justice, there is a standard. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1 says, unjust or dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord. A just weight is his delight. There are some things that are out of balance. And when things are out of balance, when the scale, uh, because they would try to sometimes con people uh, by measuring uh, the weight of the silver or gold or whatever, they would put a wrong standard to measure in order to cheat people. And God says that is an abomination and as my people you cannot practice dishonest business. In your dealings, you must deal righteously. And so, even with justice, uh, you see the image of the statue, justice being blind, and then you see uh, the scales there, 
being weighed. In Daniel chapter 5, uh, King uh, Belshazzar, he tried to appropriate the holy things of God for personal gain and for his, you know, self-aggrandizement. He tried to appropriate the holy things of God. And there was a handwriting that was seen on the wall. Freaked them all out. And the word of the Lord was, you have been weighed on the scales and you have been found wanting. You have not measured up to my standard and judgment is coming. It's the righteous judgment of God. Jesus says that you and I are to judge righteous judgment. John 7 verse 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. God's judgment evens the scale. God's judgment brings things back into alignment. The judge of all the earth, God is the judge, and he is the one to administer justice. And that's why he says, you don't need to try to get revenge. Don't try to get back. Don't try to get even because you will fail. You'll never be able to get even. You can't meet the standard of my even. And so he says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. A lot of times we get into trouble when we try to assume God's job and take on what is God's and try to do it ourselves. Whenever we try to get vengeance, we do it through unforgiveness. Or we're going to give them the silent pre treatment. We're going to cut this person off. I'm going to do something to get back at you. That there's, there's been, but the Bible says, uh-uh, don't do that. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Uh, as you love them, even though they've offended you, you're pouring coals of fire on them. You overcome evil with good. God says, vengeance is mine. He's the God of justice. Last week, I told you, I came back from Zimbabwe after ministering at the pastor's conference there, and when I came back, Thaddeus calls me. He says, I hate to welcome you back with bad news. But just early this morning, a young man was shot and killed by the police. A few blocks away, some of our members live in that community. And he brings this to my attention, and everybody is devastated. Now, those of us who are part, we probably have seen the videotape of a man that is unarmed. When the police came for a domestic issue, we see the video of what we could see. It was, it was blurry and, you know, we, we can't make things out, but we, we know he was unarmed. And lethal, lethal force was used very quickly, and we are asking why. We don't have all the information, but the information that we have is messed up. We are part of this community. We pray for our leaders. We have gone to the police department and we, we prayed there and we have a relationship with many of the officers. We're here to uh, be a light in our community. We're here to be a blessing. We're here not as church that's identified by race, but we're identified by the blood of Jesus. We've been baptized into Christ, and that's our identity. 
And so we, we, we come. I know the they, they first thing that people see is the flesh, but that's we, we who are believers know that you can't regard us after the flesh. So there's a relationship, but as I look at it, I said, this is messed up. And if, unless there's something that I'm not seeing, this is unjust. Domestic violence, since when is that a capital offense? Since when is not opening the door for the police when they come? When is that a capital offense? What happened to the good old days when they just used the billy club? I mean, that right now we're looking at that as the good old days. There's something that doesn't sit right. Now, I say I don't have all the facts. With the facts I have, I'm just speaking with the facts, with, with what I see. So, until they ask me not to believe my lying eyes, I'm just going based on what I see, a blurry thing. But it seems everyone I've talked to is like, doesn't look good. So, we'll, we'll see. But. If what we assume is, is happened, and this is different, I know uh, that people get shot and killed every day. Uh, people that look like me in this city or, or in our, you know, in the, in the Chicago land area, every day. I'm sure if I go back and look, I can go and see last night who all was shot and killed that is not making the news like it is here. But there's a verse. Uh, that speaks about these matters. Uh, and it's in Luke, it just, I'm just speaking extemporaneously right now, so I don't have the exact verse. I think it's in Luke chapter 7. But it says, to whom much is given, much is required. In other words, there's a higher standard for leadership. We hold those who have been given authority and power to a higher standard. And that is biblical, that we hold those who have been given authority. You've, given, you've been given power and authority. In the word, we see that there's a higher standard. So it hits differently. See, there are, you know, as I'm speaking, some of you have been shacking up. Some of you in here, uh, I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. That's not my intention. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, but reality, some of you have been shacking up. And you're able to come to church and continue. And really no one really knows or is, is, is talking about you. Or, we're just glad you're in church. We're glad you're here. Some maybe have committed adultery in your church today. But if I were shacking up or if I were involved in adultery, God forbid, it hits differently, right? For everybody else, it's no big deal. But I've been given authority in the church. And there is a natural expectation to a higher standard. And so a judge would not be a good judge if he just said to the murderer who killed your spouse, say, you know what? We're going to sweep that under the rug. 
you know. You would say that's a wicked judge. This is my family member, and I'm mourning the loss of my family member. And we're, we're, we're honoring the system, and we're going to the judge, and the judge is just going to let it slide? What, 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 what's this? God says that is evil. And so he says that his throne, his authority, his kingdom is founded on righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about God's justice. Now the thing about God's justice it's not always delivered on our timing. In Genesis chapter 15, uh, God speaks to Abraham. Abraham sees the stars. He sees the sand. God shows him. He says, this is how your descendants are going to be. And he says, uh, in Four generations, you know, you're going to go to Egypt. Abraham, you haven't met, uh, you don't have any children, so you haven't met Isaac, and you haven't met uh, his son Jacob, and you haven't met uh, Jacob's son Joseph yet, but uh, Joseph is basically going to be sold to Egypt, and then all the children of Israel are going to end up in Egypt. But there's a key verse he says. He says for the, let's take a look at it. For the iniquity, I said Genesis 15, right? God's justice doesn't necessarily work on our timing. He says in, I'm sorry, I was, I was in Exodus, all right? Genesis 15. And in my mind, I want to say, all right. Uh, what verse am I looking for? All right. All right, verse 12. As the sun is going down, God speaks to Abraham. Verse 13, then he said to Abraham, no, certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. That's when they get getting, uh, taken to Egypt. And they're going to be strangers in Egypt. That's what he's referring to. Um, and they will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And the nation whom they serve, I will judge. So the nation is going to afflict them, but God says he's going to judge Egypt. And you know, you've heard about the plagues, right? Okay. God says, I'm going to judge them. Afterwards, they're going to come out with possessions. And he says, you're going to go to the Father in peace. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here. And God says, they're going to come back to the land. And God is going to give them the land. He says, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The wrath of God, you read in Romans 1, is revealed against unrighteousness. But God, in his mercy, he can give people an opportunity to repent. He can give us, uh, just because God has not judged you yet, it doesn't mean that you are uh, necessarily getting away. It, it, it could be that God is just, God is just being patient. Uh, Second Peter chapter 3 says, verse 8, but beloved. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, but beloved. Do not forget this one thing. 
that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some clout slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Thank God. Thank God that he's long-suffering toward us. Not willing that all should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And God says, in my justice, I can't say to you, Abraham, wipe him out now. I have to allow them to sin some more. I have to allow their iniquity to sin some more because he's the judge of all the earth and he shall do right before I bring judgment. Now, the thing about the judgment of God, um, it doesn't just affect the individual. Do you know there can be judgments upon households? There could be judgments upon families. Uh, there could be some things which not only affect the individual that committed the trespass, but their sin and their iniquity affects their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Abraham, he was a liar. You didn't know that, huh? Oh, yeah. Abraham could lie where the sun don't shine. That man could lie. He will stand right before you and tell you that his wife is his sister. That's Abraham. Not just once, twice. Same lie. Not only Abraham, his son Isaac, liar, did the exact same thing that his daddy did. He said to his wife, Rebecca, Rebecca you're fine and let's go. When we go there, uh, I don't want no trouble. I don't want no static. I don't want that smoke. So tell him that you're my sister. Just like my daddy told Amalek, is that what he told yeah, one of them. That my wife, my, my mother was a sister, so I'm going I'm to use that same lie to save my life. Not only Isaac. Abraham was a liar. Isaac was a liar. Jacob. Y'all heard of him? Uh-huh. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all liars. There's something that was passed down. Uh, you see, Jesus said that we ought to judge. He commanded us to judge righteous judgments. Uh, there is not only the judgment of God. But the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that as a believer, you ought to be able to judge some matters. Don't you know that the saints will judge angels? The saints will administer justice to angels. He says, why are you going to court? You guys, are, you guys are an embarrassment. You're going to the world to sue one another. You can't judge these matters in the church that you got to go to sinners as believers and sue one another? Why not just accept wrong? Why not just be cheated? But instead, you're cheating each other. Paul says, you guys are an embarrassment. You have church in Corinth. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You should be able to judge some matters. You should be able to 
exercise righteous judgment. The Holy Spirit, a part of his work is to judge. He shall convict, I'm in John chapter 16, he shall convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So when you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you living, you should be able to exercise judgment. You know, back in my, my rapping days, not too long ago, I still got the dope lyrics. We used to say, we're going to serve you with justice. As a believer, you got to be able to serve with justice. There are some areas in your life that require justice. And when you are in the kingdom... Justice is foundational in the kingdom of God. And there are some things that are unjust and the Holy Spirit gives you the authority to execute justice. He gives you the authority and the right. So in Luke chapter 13, when the woman of God, uh, she's a child of Abraham, she's a daughter of Abraham, and she is bowed over with a spirit of infirmity, Jesus says in basic, that is illegal. And so what Jesus does is he exercises justice on the sickness and the infirmity that is plaguing her. Because the judge of all the earth uh, has to administer judgment, and so there has to be wrath uh, to those who practice unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed. And so when there's sin, the wages of sin brings death. So whenever there's sin, whenever there's iniquity, whenever there's impurity, whenever there's something that does not measure up to God's standard, God has to judge it. And the wages of sin is death. How does he judge it? He kills it. That's the judgment of God. He, 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 he destroys it. It says... In Ephesians chapter 2, that you and I, uh, we were dead in trespasses and sin. He made us alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. You were walking around, but you didn't know you were already judged. You were already judged. You and I, we were dead in trespasses and sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, and because of that great love wherewith he loved us, while we were sinners, Christ died for us when we were deserving God's justice. You see, Jesus is the only one that was able to handle the wrath of God. And so when the wrath of God was coming to you and me, when God's justice was coming to you and to me, Jesus got in between the wrath of God. And he took it. So, instead of our dying, the wages of sin is death, he died once and for all and satisfied God's justice. He couldn't just let sin slide. He couldn't just turn and look the other way and let it slide. He couldn't let the murderer, the rapist, the adulterer, the thief just go free because that would make him an unrighteous judge. Sin had to be dealt with. God says uh, that he's going to bring judgment to those things, to everything that is his enemy. I said before, there are some things that are passed down. Some things that were never judged in your family and in your bloodline, and they're passed down. When Jesus says, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be loose, whom Satan is bound, and Jesus heals the woman, that's the advancement of God's rule and reign, which brings judgment to the infirmity and the sickness. Whenever 
the judgment of God is executed, wherever God's justice is administered, there's a blessing that is left. You see, we don't fully understand it on this side of eternity. But let me very quickly try to make it a little bit more clear. We spent some time in Leviticus, right? I mean, dealing with the Levites, all right? God purifying the house of Levi, God purifying the, the sons of Levi. We, we, we dealt with that. The wrath of God is revealed. When the children of Israel would disobey God, the curse would come. When the children of Israel would disobey, bad things would come to them. Negative, hurtful, painful things. And God put the Levites or the priestly tribe in there to remind people of God's law and be there to help the people in the community. They were sprinkled all over the various 12 tribes, they were sprinkled all over the tribes uh, to make sure that the word of God was elevated so that people understood God's law, that God's standard was before the people and they could obey the standard of God. In doing so, the Bible says uh, that the plague which would come to destroy them and wipe them out was then kept back. In Numbers chapter 8, it says in verse 19, I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to do the work for the children of Israel in the tabernacle of meeting and to make atonement for the children of Israel. That atonement was to satisfy God's justice. The atonement means the lamb had to be slain instead of the people being slain because of their sin. Because God is holy, God had to kill an innocent lamb. Who is that pointing to? That's pointed to Jesus, the lamb of God. So he says they are there to make atonement, uh, to bring the offering to be sacrificed, the innocent animal to be killed instead of the people being killed to satisfy God's judgment. It's just a partial payment. Jesus is the one that paid the price, but this is a partial payment that they're making. For the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel. Because if there's no atonement, if the blood is not applied, then the plague of death is coming. The judgment of God is coming upon your life unless the blood is sprinkled upon your life. The judgment is coming. God's, just, ju God's justice is coming to the third and fourth generation unless the blood, unless someone applies the blood, there's a curse that is in the Arthur's family. And it's, it's killed uh, my grandfather, it's, it's, it's taken out my uncle, my aunt, all over, uh, but my father got a hold of the word of God and he stopped the plague from reaching his children. There's a plague. Uh, because your great-grandfather was a liar and a fornicator and your daddy was a rolling stone and there's a plague that was a release. There's a demonic porthole uh, because of disobedience that has given access to the enemy and given him legal right to mess you up. But God, when you are born again and he gives you the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus has interfered, he has given you the authority to execute righteous judgment and Jesus says this is illegal for you as a child of God to be bound. I'm about to, I'm about to shut it down, but you got to see this. You got to see this. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is amazing. In uh, in 1 Kings, you guys remember David, right? David, uh, as a king, he had enemies. And in his lifetime, he was dealing with the enemies. 
Uh, he was dealing with all kinds of enemies. Uh, but there were some enemies he did not deal with. David had a nephew by the name of Joab. That was his nephew. Um, there were sons of Zeruiah. As you go and see David's family tree, you'll see David had a sister named Zeruiah. And she had sons, Job, uh, Joab, Abishai, and Ashel. All right? So this is in David's house. If you know anything about David, he was a mighty man of war, but he was a horrible father. He never disciplined his children. He never administered justice in his own house. And so his nephew was a murderer, murdered more than once. He, would just, he didn't just do things in war when it was fair, but he was a straight-up murderer. And David, he said, although I'm anointed king, I am too weak to deal with these sons of Zeruiah. I'm not strong enough. He's anointed, but he failed to administer justice. When you see Solomon come to the throne, David tells, I don't have time to preach this, but David tells Solomon when he's dying, he said, there's a man, Shimei, who cursed me with a bitter curse. I promised him that I wouldn't kill him but you don't let him die of a good old age. Uh, he's my enemy. He tells his son, Solomon, he said, Joab, uh, he is a murderer. I, I was too weak to take care of him. You got to deal with him. And so, Solomon, he deals with them, and in 1 Kings chapter 2, after he deals with them, with the enemies of his father, it says in the last verse of 1 Kings chapter 2, verse number 46, so the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went and struck him down, and he died. That's Shimei who cursed him, his father. Thus, the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. These are not Solomon's demons. These are not Solomon's problem. These people didn't do anything to Solomon these were not enemies of Solomon, that there were enemies that his father failed to deal with. And you and I, we are dealing with enemies that our fathers failed to deal with. Our parents didn't plead the blood over, G uh, over their lives, and they didn't plead the blood of Jesus over our lives. And there are some things that are in our system that came from our bloodline. And that's why no one gets married. That's why everyone gets divorced. That's why there's children out of wedlock. That's why everyone has diabetes. That's why everyone's overweight. That's why everyone is, has an attitude and is depressed. And there's always suicide in the family. Uh, because there are some things that your father did not deal with. There are some things that he did not execute judgment on. And because your father did not exercise judgment and bring justice to those areas, uh, they're still there and they plague you. But God is a God of justice. And there's no righteousness in your life without justice. And so until we administer the justice of God in those areas uh, that have not been dealt with by our fathers, it's going to be our problem. And Solomon cannot be established in his calling, in his position, until he deals with the demons that are in his background. So I'm done. Stand to your feet. Ha. Ha. There's some things in your life that you must administer justice to. 
because they're out of line with God's standard in your life. And your family's always been out of order. Your family bloodline, there's always been disorder. People done what they want to do. Uh, someone's always been there to commit adultery in Jesus' name. It breaks now. The, the curse is broken. I like the fact that God says, I will do war with Amalek from generation to generation in Exodus 17 God says I will do war when God does war he's the Lord of hosts and he's the Lord that administers justice we're not going to let this slide and you're not going to let this slide in your life what is it that must be dealt with what is that unforgiveness that's in the bloodline? Everyone is mad at somebody in your family and harboring stuff, and you guys can't even have Thanksgiving together. Uh, what is that? Uh, because that thing that is in your family, if it's never been dealt with, the same way there can be a blessing, and I'm walking in the blessing of my father. I'm walking right now in the blessing. That genuine faith that is in me, uh, the genuine faith that is in my children, that was in their grandfather, that's in their grandmother. There's a generational blessing. But in order for us to experience the generational blessing, we had to bring judgment to the illegal activity If you're too nice, if you're too passive as a believer, you'll say, I'm too weak. You know what? Deliverance is messy. It's not pretty. It's ugly. When we talk about you having to administer justice and deal with things, that means you got to confront some things that you really would rather not confront. But if you fail to deal with it, your children are going to have to deal with it. If you don't get deliverance, and if you don't address it, you're giving because people die off demons don't die you, 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 you eventually will get old and be with the Lord and what you fail to deal with your children those spirits are going to establish residence and territory in your children in their life He's the God of justice. And God says, I'm not just going to let that slide in your life. We need to apply the blood of Jesus. Oh, we need to forgive. We need to get restoration. We need to call sin out and say, devil, you're not going to do this. We draw a bloodline around our family. In the name of Jesus, how oh, we come against premature death. How we take authority over the spirit. How the devil is a lie. How, when are you going to get righteously indignant about the injustice how that has been plaguing? Yeah, we get mad about everything else, but we don't get mad about what the devil is doing in our life. We just get mad at the politicians. We just get mad at the employer. How, but when are you going to get mad at the demonic principality that is beyond, the, behind the darkness? How that is no, we don't fight against flesh and blood. My problem is not with the Democrats or with the Republicans. My problem is not with the city officials. That's not my problem. Uh, there's a principality in power that we're taking authority in the name of Jesus. I think, I, I think, I, I, I think I'm going to have to let you all go. I'm going to have to let you guys go and pray and, and, and dismiss. And for the, for, for the rest of us, uh, we're going to stand on business. because it's, it, it's not going to happen until we deal with it. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now. Lift your hands to heaven in Jesus' name. Say thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that cleanses me from all unrighteousness. I renounce the devil and all of his activity in my life 
and in my bloodline. From me forward, my family is to be blessed. In Jesus' name, I break the power of the curse that has been plaguing my bloodline. And it stops with me. I might not have started it, but in Jesus' name, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish it now because Jesus said, it is finished in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, by the word of God, by the spirit of God, by the blood of the lamb, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established according to your faith, be it unto you in the name of you. You might not have started this curse in your family. It didn't start with you, uh, but in Jesus name, you're about to end it. You didn't start this fight, but you will finish it. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Be safe in Jesus' name. Serve the Lord. Come back in the blessing of the fullness of the gospel of Christ. You are dismissed for the rest of us. You're free to go. Hallelujah to Jesus. I need the prayer warrants to intercede right now. Something is happening. We're taking authority right now. And it might get messy. I need all my ministers right now. No, pastors. Come forward. Shout loud.